Hello everyone! Today we are going to be talking about how to write your artist CV. But before that, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. So, Clara and I were just having a lot of arguments on this prior to the stream. Clara, can you explain the difference between a resume and a CV? The easiest way I would describe it Usually a resume is a very condensed version of your professional history. It's highly curated because you're applying to a job. A CV can be 26 pages. In fact, sometimes I think it's a competition to see whose is longer. What's your definition, Lauren? I, I feel like that's more or less right, but it took me a very long time to be okay with a resume being a single page. That was hard for me to do. But yeah, I've seen CVs that go on and on and on and on. It's just like a collection of everything that you've done in the professional world, more or less. And I think where you use them is also different. For example, a resume I think of if you're applying to a full-time nine to five office job, CV, you may give it to a gallery who is hosting your solo exhibition. And so context also matters. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, which is very easy to forget, people don't look at your paperwork <laughs> for that long. How long do you think they look at it, Lauren? When I've gone over job applications, it is about two seconds. <laughs> and so you really want to keep only the things that you think that person is going to want to see. And so you got to pick four or five points that you feel like are really important about yourself and your career. Another thing to consider is to tailor your paperwork to your application. For example, if I'm applying for a teaching position at a university, I'm gonna really wanna stress my professional development in terms of lectures, exhibitions, publications, but if I'm applying for a marketing position at an arts organization, that's less important. It's more important that I have experience in marketing. So it may be that I leave off some of the exhibitions so I can make more space for some of the marketing information. What do you do, Lauren, when you shift between applications? I do the same thing. Well, the first thing I do is I have a CV, a master CV that has everything, everything. And then I will take that if they want a resume, I will do something different. I really have to only pick a few points and kind of collage those together. But if they want a CV, I will maybe reorder some sections. So for instance, with education, I make sure that the education points are at the top of that page because those are most likely to be read first. And then I'll also keep things to be more uh, academic or institutional. Those things take priority over say, I don't know, uh, being in an exhibition somewhere in, I don't know, Sweden or something like that. Slutnir says, I guess I will have to resume my resume. <laughs> and by the way, as a follow-up, what does CV mean? CV means curriculum vitae. And I can actually put that in the chat for people who would like to know the spelling of that. Yeah. And Lauren, I'm just wondering, why do you think it is so confusing for people how to make an artist resume and CV as opposed to just general resume? Well, I think it's hard just in general writing a resume. I think everybody hates doing it. But an artist's one, I think the the role of an artist is is vague for a lot of people. It's not like being a plumber. There are a lot of different things that an artist does or can do, and it can be really hard to choose which things seem really valid to go on that list for whatever you're applying for. And Julius Nichols is asking, and when you don't have any experience at all, <laughs> that's when it's the most stressful. For me, yeah. I'm fairly established. It's just a matter of what do I choose to put on. My suggestion is that you look at the experience that truly is relevant. I've had people put down, oh, I worked at a coffee shop and they're applying for a teaching position. 
don't put that in because it doesn't help. It just clutters them trying to get past that and seeing the information that's actually relevant. And so it may feel embarrassing to have a short resume, but I would much prefer to see a resume that's short and has relevant information than to just fill it with stuff just so you can <laughs> get it really long. Do you agree, Lauren, or not? <laughs> I think that that's hard because when you're very young and don't have that much experience yet, it also can look kind of bad to have, say, two things on your resume. And when I was in college, having a tiny, tiny bit of padding was okay. But I would say I'm using that word in a very specific way way. I don't mean just putting something random on there like dog sitting. Don't do that. That does look bad. But if you, for instance, a library show, that's something or a show at a coffee shop. That's something that you might do as a younger artist that feels maybe extraneous when you are older and have more things, but it's totally appropriate to have when you're just starting out. Tell us in the chat, who here has sat down to write an artist's resume or CV? And tell us what the experience was like. Was it easy? Was it confusing? Were you lost? Because I have guided a lot of students and recent graduates on how to write resumes. And a lot of them were horrified by how many changes <laughs> I crossed out on their resume. It actually is a difficult thing to do well. Now, in terms of the having no experience thing, I don't think it's a bad thing for people to know you're inexperienced. I mean, if I see a resume and it says that you graduated in 2020, duh, I'm going to know that you don't have a lot of experience. And so there's not a lot of way around that. And so my feeling is that why beat around the bush? They know you're young. It's not difficult to tell. <laughs> I think that's okay. I just think also when you're going through things so fast to have only two things on a page also looks a little weird. Rachel says, insight on defining quote, our race, establishing carving space for diversity and everything, early publications, for example, working for British GQ years ago to include or not. If it's relevant, if you're applying to work at another publication that's sort of in the same field, Absolutely. I think that experience going back many, many years is always helpful if it's related. If it's not, then leave it out. Another tip, don't get fancy with graphic design. Again, I can see past your pretty square <laughs> that's so perfectly aligned with your line coming across and little I don't care. Okay. I, I just want to get the information. If anything, I get annoyed when there's fancy graphic design that makes it hard for me to read the information. Because when I'm reading a resume, I just want bullet points, facts. I'm not there to absorb the nuances of your color and shape language. Actually, when I see something too well designed, but this also just me, might be my arena of the world. When I see something too well designed, I get suspicious of it. I say to myself, what are they hiding behind that really sleek design? Why do they need to make it look so nice? That doesn't mean make it ugly and make things out of alignment or whatever, but you, you don't need to have the really fancy fast font with the, with the little leaf leaf bullet points that look like leaps or check marks or anything like that <laughs> you can get you're better than that i find it reassuring that you don't need fancy design so those of us who suck at it <laughs> don't have to worry and just put it in google docs and use ariel juliet is asking where can they buy that really cool mug you have clara <laughs> Go down to the YouTube video description and you want to click on the link that says buy Art Prof merch. We've got a lot of fun stuff in there. Oh, oh yeah. Don't. Don't, don't use don't. Comic Sans. Just don't do it. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. It just, it looks so silly. Just don't do it, everybody. I think a part of that too there, there's um, 
don't over format things either. Within a font, there's bolding, italicizing, underlining. Just use it where it's absolutely necessary. If you go overboard, it starts looking like a silly font, gets very crazy chaotic again. All right, so Tiago says, I've written my CV in January, really enjoyed the process. Well, good, because I don't. <laughs> now it's easier because I just pick and choose from a really long CV, but it can get easier. And Art of Lindsay says, in Belgium, they expect both. If you are just graduating, you need to have the experience as well. So frustrating. Lauren, I saw an internship listing to be an intern at the Washington Post. And they said you had to be a college sophomore or junior, and you had to have, quote, major newsroom experience. It's like, isn't that the point of the internship? And who, by the age of 19, has worked in a major newsroom? That made me really mad. Yeah, I think that's a little gatekeepy. That generally means that the people that do have those opportunities are either going to some fancy school that has those connections where they can get you in as a class and work with so-and-so, or you are taking time and resources to kind of figure these things out really early on, which is hard and only available to some people. I want to give a shout out to RB Dick. Thank you so much for the super sticker. We greatly appreciate your support. C. Karam is asking about, what about name cards? I'm going to assume you mean business cards. I have not printed a business card for years and years. The only time I ever used them was when I was at a professional conference, but I don't go to those that often. So I don't really think it's worth plunking down $100 to get them printed. Do you get them done, Lauren? I do business cards, but for a different reason than any of this. I agree if you're going to some kind of conference. The last conference I went to was the CIA back in College Art Association back in 2020. And really people were just sharing their information on their phone. They either have a Twitter or social media or whatever. Uh, I do use business cards and use a lot of them when I'm doing things at craft fairs or selling things through my shop online because people give those to a friend and then that friend is like, oh, I like this art. Oh, maybe I'll buy something from them. And that works, but it's weird. Not for the super professionally stuff anymore. The best piece of advice I can give about writing CVs and resumes, keep it really simple and clean. Again, when people are reviewing these resumes and CVs, you don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> and, and really what you have to do is look at a lot of CVs to realize, oh, that's why that's annoying. Because when you're an artist, you're just looking at your CV because you're working on it, okay? But as somebody who has looked at a big stack of resumes, I can tell you there are a lot of things you just start rolling your eyes at after seeing them 500 times. Do you think that's true, Lauren? So yes, I agree. I've not had the same experience with you where I'm not fancy enough to have been a person that's read five bajillion CVs, but you can get this experience, any of you can get this experience by, say, reading a, an issue of New American Paintings, where there is a little, includes a little CV thing. And going through that whole issue, you can pretty quickly figure out what you get tired of, what comes up a lot, what, what looks like padding, what's well-written, what's not well-written. That, that's a way to do it without having that fancy job where you can see all that stuff. And keep in mind, your resume is going to change as you progress in your career. The way you write it is going to change. Lauren, we were saying earlier that you're not quite an emerging artist, and yet you're still a student. And so <clears throat> how do you define yourself on paper? It gets very challenging. And I'm in a funny place where for the longest time, my CV was all about academia and shows and grants and publications. And now I'm like, I don't care. This is just who I am. <laughs> Because I'm doing art prop now and none of that matters. <laughs> yeah, now you work for yourself. So you can have whatever CV you want that is good for yourself. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of conversations out there in the art world right now about how emerging artists is a very dissatisfying word to use to describe any kind of artist. And it's just too vague. And then the only other terms out there are mid-career and late career. And there's nothing really in between 
emerging artist and mid-career. I'm definitely not mid-career yet. I am not fancy at all. And I'm also still, I feel old, but I'm still fairly young on the grand scheme of things. But I had to put myself down as an emerging artist on, on some application and that felt so wrong. I said, I've been in this too long now. I'm, I'm, I'm not in Kansas anymore. I'm not, I'm not Dorothy with the red shoes. Remember, just because you see a category on a lot of people's resumes, it doesn't mean you have to have it too. These are categories that tend to be categories that not everybody has. Lectures, residencies, awards, teaching, curatorial, commissions, publications, press, collections. For the longest time, Lauren, I never did artist residencies because I had kids. I think I went to my first artist residency three years ago and I'm 45. And you've done wow. way more than I have. I haven't done and that many. <laughs> way more than yeah. me. It's, you only put down the category, as you said, when it's appropriate to put down the category. I've got the same experience as you, except with collections. You've had a lot of people that have, that have purchased your work. I'm, I'm still on the beginning end of that. I'm not going to put my next door neighbor who's bought so-and-so drawing for me. That's going to look really bad. I'm going to wait until some museum or publication or something collects a work. Let's talk about how to list an exhibition because this gets very confusing in terms of what information truly is necessary. So I'm going to show you a version that I think is not good for your resume in terms of formatting. Lauren, what do you think is the problem with the way this exhibition listing is worded? There are too many words that I don't need. I really don't need the exact dates of the show, especially if you've got 20 years of experience on your CV. I only need the year. And there's also just a lot of words after that. Juried exhibition, uh, the town, the, the state. I don't even put the town sometimes, especially if it's, I don't know. What about you? What do you think's wrong with it? I just think there's so much you could cut out. I mean, it's awesome that Benedict Cumberbatch during your show, but I'm sorry, people looking at your resume, that's not a deal breaker <laughs> for whether they're going to hire you. And I do think location matters because let's say you're just getting started, most likely a lot of your shows are going to be local and that's fine. But if you have been around for a long time and you've only exhibited in Delaware, that's showing that you're not getting yourself out there so much. So mm -hmm. I do think location does help. This is so much better. I mean, Lauren, this is the exact same information, but isn't this easier to read? Yeah, yeah. Getting rid of actually that juried exhibition part should be something that's a header and maybe select exhibitions, not something that needs to be repeated. If you find yourself having to repeat something over and over and over again in your listings, that probably means you need to consolidate in some way. W315 is saying, have we covered who's going to be reading these CVs? Who are we trying to reach with them? That's a really good point. It goes back to what we said about tailoring it for the application. But this also is a signal that you need to do your research. Find out who's going to be reading the resume. Sometimes you have no idea because it's just a job and it's going to all these people. Other times it's going to a gallery and there's only like two people who might be looking at it. So definitely do your research and see what their interest is. Now, after a while, you may not need to include everything. In the beginning, I put everything down. <laughs> it's like I had a show at the local library, I had one at the cafe. Those aren't on my resume anymore because I have a million now. Are they so on your CV? No, they're gone. I think that's now, important too. Where do you cut off things at each point? Sorry, you've been talking. No, absolutely. But I guess, Lauren, my question is, how do you know when it's time to take something off when you don't need it? I think... A lot of it for me is is intuitive, I think. Well, one of them is just your page, your page real estate. For the resume, you only have one page. So if your exhibitions are taking up half the page and going off the page into the next page, you need to cut some stuff out. 
But for something like the CV, it's a little bit harder because that can be as many pages as you want. So more often I'm looking for trends or the types of shows I'm starting to have. If I'm having shows that are starting to be in, in different states, different regions of the U.S., I can probably start cutting out some of those more local, smaller shows, unless they're a place that's very near and dear, mean something to you specifically as an artist that's important to convey. Hello, Norena. Thank you so much for joining us on your first live stream. The way that I cut back on shows is I list my exhibitions by year. So let's say in 2009, I had three shows. <clears throat> I'm going to want to add all three of those in there because if I <laughs> start taking them out, there's not a lot. Left. Right. But let's say in 2008, I had 10 shows. It's okay to cut out a few because for that year, there's so many that as long as you have representation that you are constantly exhibiting on a regular basis, that's more important. And so I have exhibitions that go way, way back that are maybe not as prestigious as what I'm doing now necessarily, but I leave them there because they're an indication of, oh, yes, I was alive that year. That's true, actually. Now that you say that, I realize I definitely do that, too, where the it seems like the the previous three, two or three years are very important to make sure you're showing a, a pretty wide view of what you're doing. And then, yeah, you can really cut back when you're getting back to 2010, 2009, all that. Let's talk about collections. This is, I think, the biggest offender in terms of really <laughs> blatant padding that just, oh, as somebody who's reviewing it, it just makes you cry a little tear for the desperation <laughs> that you see, because it's just not good, guys. Ted and Sarah Lou, I'm in their collection. I'm also in Sam Lou's collection. I mean, come on. No, I'd rather see nothing than see that. I've got a question about this that's kind of related, at least to what you just described, the situation you just described. This person that's going to see the CV is going to look at that, see your last name matches their last name, and be like, oh my god, they put their parents on here or something. But okay... <laughs> I, I'm in a situation where one of the, uh, this is with a show, one of the biggest shows that I've worked on did happen to be one that I inherited that was putting together my dad's work. My dad is in a different part of the art field. It has nothing to do with my dad giving me show stuff. I don't know how to word that in a way that doesn't look horribly uh, desperate on my part. And yet it was still a big deal. How do you do something like that? Or do you just but leave it was out? That was an exhibition, not a collection, right? Right, right. But I still feel like it falls under the same thing. Or what if you're working with family members? Or what if you're working with uh, <laughs> people with your last name? I don't think it's the same thing. Because the show is not the same thing as a collection. This, you can just tack the name on. <laughs> it's not difficult. But a show, if you assuming you had it at a legitimate gallery and organization, which you did... I think that's fine. I just think when it's just slapped on, no. Okay, okay, so it's just the, uh, no context, <laughs> this person, <laughs> you're in this collection. <laughs> so again, but how do you know who's worth putting on your collection? Because David Mugar is a very famous philanthropist in Boston, so he's easily recognized. Any major museum collection is fine. My thought is just to err on having nothing in this area <laughs> because it's <laughs> fine to not have it. You don't have to have this. Yeah, and that's really only if you're selling stuff too, I feel like. I don't know. Awards. Let's talk about awards. There's so many awards out there. And again, this has to be your call. What you think is appropriate for your level of experience and what you're aiming to do this is sort of similar to collections, but it's a little less ridiculous in that for a lot of people, when they get some form of recognition, doesn't matter where it's at, what competition or context, it's still very meaningful. I mean, we give out prizes and honorable mentions for the Art Prof monthly art dares. And I'm sure for a lot of people, that's awesome because we give all these cool prizes and it's a really fun experience. But I wouldn't put that on your artist resume because it's not quite the same thing as being in a legit award. You saying we're not fancy enough, Clara? 
someday we will be. Are we not authorities in the art world? (laughs) Well, so what's the difference here between Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship, Paula Krasner, versus Juror's Commendation from the Cambridge Art Association Members Exhibition? Yeah, these, the two at the top that you've highlighted are ones that are very well-known organizations that have been established for a very long time and have a history of, what's, what's the word? They're prestigious. They've got some prestige to them. Also, this is confusing from a terminology point of view, but an artist residency for a lot of people is not an award. And I oftentimes people see putting residencies as awards. What I would do instead, make a separate section that says artist residencies and put it there because that's not fair to lump it with the awards because it's such a different experience. What do you think, Warren? This is something that I myself have had a hard time with because some residencies do give awards or scholarships to the people that are going, which you might want to mention, because it's like a tier above just getting into the residency itself. And so I think in the past, I have put it under awards, but I also think it's absolutely appropriate and should go under residencies, maybe italicized underneath that you got a, a grant or award to go there. The reason I think it shouldn't go under awards, especially, is that there's so many types of residencies. There are some, you might as well just be booking a trip to the Bahamas. They make you pay for everything. There's others where you don't pay a dime and everything in between. And so I think sticking it under awards, it's not quite accurate. Okay, writing a job description. There's so much more to your job than you think. (laughs) I was helping Kat write a job description for her teaching artist position here at ArtProf. And I read it, I was like, you do way more than that. And then I helped her rewrite the description. She's like, wow, I sound really experienced and fancy. (laughs) That's what you do. Like, it's so easy when you're at a job, you take for granted how specialized your work is. Well, it just becomes your work, right? You're autopiloting it. Well, we don't like to think we're autopiloting things, but we do a lot of the time. And you're just, the thing that you find super easy in just your day-to-day humdrum stuff is something that someone else would have to train forever to figure out how to do. So love yourself or get someone that sees your work, maybe a coworker, Uh, who's in a slightly different position or someone who has worked with you in a professional capacity to edit that job description for you and make sure that you're including all the things you're supposed to be doing. And I think you can make simple things sound fancy. Like to me and you, Lauren, hopping on this live stream, it doesn't feel like a big deal. But if I had to explain to somebody how to do a live stream, how to use StreamYard, how to do the mess, it's a lot of tech training that's involved. And so you really have to take a step back and say, what do I really do? Because I spent the past year training faculty in school districts and universities on how to teach online. And what we do here is not trying to toot my own horn, but we're a little advanced. <laughs> we we do the fancy stuff. And, and that's what you described. Not to mention all of these, I'm going to call them more soft skills, like the organizational stuff with all of your lists and the learning how to public speak. A lot of people just freeze up when they go online or when they when they go public trying to talk. So there are all of these parts that all fit together in this one seemingly simple thing like a live stream. But you really got to break it down into all the little skills areas. Speaking of skills, there (laughs) should be a section, if warranted, on your CV about skills. Now, this gets, again, very vague because what's a skill? And oftentimes people will list software and I would absolutely do that because it does make a difference if you know how to use Illustrator, which I don't. (laughs) So you want to do that. But Lauren, I've also seen people write painting, drawing, paper making, charcoal. They list that under skills. Do you think that's a good idea or not? I think it depends on the position. We had also talked about this prior, but I also just hold up one second because you said you put this on your CV. I never put the skills on my CV. It's only ever on the resume. 
and it's always changes depending on what the resume is. Why would you put your skills on your CV? That's all your know. professional just, accomplishments. I don't know. I stick it there. Maybe I've been doing it wrong for 20 years. <laughs> I, I was just curious. I mean, I always take your lead on the CV stuff because you've been doing the professional stuff. You're way more professional than me, Clara. So I'm you wondering know, if there's something I'm missing. I don't have a skills section because I don't have any things. You don't have any skills? No, I guess I don't. Tell. Oh, no, I have Premiere. I can use Premiere. Yes. You know, you know a lot. You also can put OBS. And... So. Uh, every camera you've ever used. Yeah. So, okay. So that's a thing I, on my resume, I'll have a skills section, but then subsectioned into different types of skills. So if you're a filmmaker, you can put all the cameras that you've used because that is important, relevant stuff. Or if you do editing kinds of things, or maybe you are, are do office stuff that requires Adobe or a designer, you can put all your design programs, or maybe you do some kind of like social kind of stuff. Maybe you know languages, you can put your languages down there. Like, I think it's important to divide them. Lindsay says, what is Maya? Maya is 3D computer animation software. They use it for big movies like Pixar and stuff like that. It makes my head hurt looking at Maya. <laughs> it's really hard. My husband uses it all the time and it's incredibly difficult to use. Also, we should bring up Lauren. There are some software you may not want to put on. I don't think you should yeah. put down iMovie as an editing <laughs> software that you're familiar with. Because, well, because Premiere is a professional industry standard editing software. iMovie doesn't cut it. And so it's not every software. It's the ones that really are industry standard. Yeah, that's the key word there, the industry standard. Also, if you're not sure what that standard is, take a look at what the job description is asking for, because usually they'll say, oh, it's a plus if you work in uh, Microsoft Office, which is, you know, an industry standard for that particular thing, or Creative Cloud, same thing. C-Control says, Clara, you could put down Procreate. Yeah, but I think <laughs> skills implies a certain degree of competence, <laughs> which I don't. <laughs> All right. I know in the fine art world and art school, people make a big fuss about internships. I don't think they're that necessary. I mean, it's fine if you get one. That's no problem. But I know a lot of art school students who are very stressed. I've never done an internship. I'm never going to get a job. I'm like, I never had an internship. It's fine. Yeah. You know what? I'm thinking back. I don't think I've ever had one either. I think I might have had a very loose one at the Sharon Arts at one point in time. But people are, at least in New York, they're like, oh, they're like, oh I need to work at David Zwerner. I need to work at some gallery. And yeah, you don't need that. Well, and also, I think a lot of internships are set up with that gatekeeping mindset because almost all of them are unpaid. Who has the funds to be able to do an unpaid internship for many months at a oh, time? Oh, it's predatory. It's predatory. And also, a lot of them are terrible experiences. I mean, I know somebody who was at a fancy schmancy Chelsea, New York City art gallery. She's like, yeah, I filed paperwork and got nothing out of it. It was horribly boring and it did not help me at all. And so some internships might look great on paper, but some of them are really not good. So do it if you have the opportunity, if you think it's going to be a good experience, but it is not going to be a deal breaker in terms of getting a job. Okay, education. Lauren, what's wrong <laughs> with this listing? <laughs> I was not too fun president. <laughs> Yeah, you should probably take out the student body president. Although there's a lot of work that goes into being a student body president. So <laughs> I don't know. Also, I wouldn't put your GPA. Who cares about GPA in art school? Sometimes you can put like the summa cum laude thing. I've seen that depending on your field. If you're in science, maybe that's important. Again, I don't know how important that is in the arts, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody cares about anything except, oh, you got the degree. And that's why I say to art school students, listen, I know you're upset about that B plus you got last semester. Nobody cares after graduation. Just pass. 
You know what? You know what? I do do a thing that is very counterintuitive and I feel like is is a no-no on a on a resume. I put my time at RISD as as in my education section, even though I didn't graduate from there, because I do get a foot in the door with that RISD thing still. It's bizarre to me, but that's like the one thing I think if you've got like a transfer between schools and you feel like one of those is relevant or important in some way, it might be okay. Oh, I think that's totally relevant. If you start at one school and end up at another, you just don't put down that you got the degree. I absolutely agree right, that. Right. Yeah, I just say studied at between year and year. I get this question a lot because there's a lot of artists out there who had degrees in another field or maybe they even worked professionally in another field and now they're working as an artist and they say, well, my degree is in biology and I got it a long time ago. I should leave it off because it's not art school. I'm like, no, put it on. It makes you look so different and it really makes you stand out in the art field. Yeah, this is different than, say, having a totally non-related job on your resume. That, <laughs> I mean, it's just the amount of commitment that it takes to, to study in a field and then graduate in a field. So it shows, it's a shorthand to show that you have four years in biology, at least under your belt. And yeah, it does look interesting. I wouldn't list all the science jobs you've had for the past three decades, but I think leaving the education part of it, it's a nice thing to have because then people get a bigger picture of who you are. And I think in the art world, that is never a bad thing. And professional affiliations, again, really vague. I think a lot of people don't really know <laughs> what to do with this category. So here, we have a bunch, Boston Printmakers, Printmakers Guild, Copley Society, people looking at a resume, they have no idea what is your relationship because Boston Printmakers, you had to be juried in and accepted as a member. There are some organizations just pay a fee and you're in. And there's some where you have to be invited or whatever. So how do you know what to put down, Lauren? <laughs> Well, I've never even heard of this category until you brought it up because nobody wants to include me in their club and I never even realized that there were clubs to be excluded from. So <laughs> I look at this and I, I, I don't really have any. It just seems like words to me mostly. It's not, I'm not familiar with it. The one that I was really surprised by is I was teaching a professional development course for seniors in printmaking at RISD and I had them do a test resume. And so a bunch of them put down RISD Museum because RISD students get free membership to the RISD Museum. And they said that was a professional installation. I was like, no. If you're on the <laughs> board of trustees, that's a professional affiliation. But if you buy an $80 membership to the MFA Boston to get free, and that's not an affiliation. Okay, so I would just say, like collections and some of these more vague sections, just err on not including it. Because again, this will not be a deal breaker. Some things are like jobs you've held in the past, but this is just little bells and whistles. It really does not matter. Juliet says, you think the art school has an important spot in the resume. It matters in art school, which art school you graduated from. Uh, yeah, I think that, well, for some schools, they have this kind of name recognition, which we've talked about seems a little bit unfair, but is still a thing that people see it and they recognize and they say, oh, well, that's a good school. I've heard of that. Or, oh, I know someone who graduated from there. And so that's where that becomes important. So you can apply this in two ways. One, you can have this very fancy art school that you've been to. So RISD or Yale or those or Columbia or those kinds of places have that kind of poll or recognition we're talking about. Or if you're looking for a job in your local area that has a relationship with the school or a kind of trust with your local art school, then it's also really good to have your school that you went to on there. I think the important thing is do you have a degree? <laughs> and number two, the art school only matters if the person who's hiring you is an alum. So for That's, example, yeah. 
if I'm hiring and I get a whole bunch of resumes and this person is from RISD and this person is from MICA, the only difference is when I interview the RISD person, I may say, oh, did you have this professor? He was there when I was in the 90s. We might connect that way. Or maybe down the line, there's an alumni network and you can say, oh, I went to RISD and stuff. That can be a little plus, but people do not judge your skills or performance based on the school you went to for the most part. I'm not saying across the board, but I care way more about performance and skills than I do about what school you went to because you can go to Yale and not be that helpful. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. It, it, the school has no bearing on how good of an artist or professional you are, really. But I agree with you. Some people like to make those connections, those little, like, I'm, I'm at Hunter. If I see another Hunter student or alum, we say, oh, hey, is, yeah, are you still in the same building? Oh, is that leak still there? Oh, is there cockroaches? And that, <laughs> those side conversations can get you in sometimes. They can, because you get to socialize in a way that's built in. There, there's no entry point for that because just immediately you have a connection with the place, the people, and that can be very useful in terms of looking for a job. We do have other streams, for example, on how to write an artist statement and a guide to artist invoices and contracts. Art Prof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel so you can tell us about your crappy internships where you got paid <laughs> nothing and had to sit in the museum like a security guard, but be told it was an internship. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave us a comment because YouTube gods have not been kind recently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. All of you are making it possible for somebody in the world to have access to free art education. You are making a difference for all of those artists. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.